All right, in this lesson, we're going to start talking about shear strength. So we finished shear stress. Now we're moving on to these limiting conditions of shear stress that result in soil failure or just material failure in general. Um, we'll start with simple material like steel, and then we'll move on to soil, which is a little bit more of a complicated material. Um, all right, so one of the key concepts here is that every material has some kind of limiting amount of stress that can be imposed on it before it will fail or exhibit some sort of permanent alteration to its shape, right? If you bend metal, it will. sometimes it'll go right back, sometimes it won't. It will, you'll, you'll fail it and it will permanently bend. Um, so let's take a look at probably the simplest possible loading condition we could ever apply to a material. And we'll look at steel, which is one of the simplest materials to analyze as well. So here we have a steel bar that's in tension so here's our steel bar. We just put a force on it um, in the axial direction. So the downward and upward force have to be the same. Um, let's imagine that we fix the steel bar right at the base. So there's a fixed condition right here. Um, what that means is that the bar can't move up, but it can contract in. So we don't constrain the horizontal direction there. And then when we impose this load, the steel bar will stretch and then it will eventually fail. It'll reach a condition of failure. And so the things that we can measure when we do this test are the axial force and the axial displacement. So the force, maybe we would use a load cell, the displacement, an LVDT, um, something like that. We can also measure the cross-sectional area of the bar and its length, right? So we need those two things too. So here we have four measured quantities. You can see force, area, length, and displacement. And then we can calculate from that the stress and the strain, right? So axial stress is just the force divided by the cross-sectional area, and the axial strain is the change in length divided by the initial length of the uh, specimen. All right, now if you plot the stress-strain curve for steel from an, a uniaxial test on steel, you initially have this a linear elastic region. And if you were to be within that linear elastic region and then you unload the steel bar, so you apply some force and then you let go of that force, the bar will stretch and then it will go back to exactly where it was before. It will not have yielded yet. So there's no permanent deformation or permanent strain. But of course, there is a, a limit to the amount of force that you can apply. And then eventually you will reach a condition of yield where the bar will just stretch and stretch at the same force. So you come up here along the uh, elastic region, and then you go along this horizontal region. And then it turns out that steel eventually will have some post-yield hardening. So you'll reach another point, and then it will have this kind of funny um, hook to it before it will rupture, and then it breaks. Um, all right, one thing that I'll say is that uh, it's, it's often difficult to conceptualize this test because at least my brain tends to think in terms of load control. So it's like, how much force can you apply to the steel bar? You keep increasing the force and then boom, it just snaps all of a sudden. So sometimes students struggle to conceptualize like how can we get this part of the curve if the steel bar is just gonna break as soon as we exceed its capacity. Well, what you can do maybe to think um, instead is to think about you're controlling the displacement and measuring the force. So you're telling the load system, I want you to make the displacement increase by one millimeter every hour. And it's going to perfectly ramp up the displacement so that it reaches one millimeter after an hour or whatever, whatever it's going to be. Well, in that case, you're controlling the strain, basically, right? And you can measure the force. So in that case, you're controlling strain. You get up to this point, then you're still controlling strain, and you can easily follow along that line. And then you're still controlling strain and measuring force. That's a little bit of a different way to think about it. That, in fact, is how most loading systems work. When we do a test on a steel bar, we're controlling displacement, not force. It's safer for the um, load control system. All right, so now based on this stress-strain curve, let's define a couple of, of constants here. First, when we're in the elastic range, the uh, slope of the stress versus strain curve is the Young's modulus E. Okay, now if we had loaded the specimen differently, say we did it in torsion or something like that, the, the torque or the torsional stress versus the torsional strain would not be E. The reason this is E is that we are doing an axial test. 
when you do a uniaxial test, you're measuring Young's modulus directly. Uh, okay, the uniaxial stress at which the material yields is called the yield stress, sigma sub y. And then the corresponding strain at which it yields is called the yield strain, epsilon sub y. Um, okay, for now, we're going to ignore this little hardening part over here, and we'll just treat it as if this thing goes up and then reaches yield and stays yielded. It's kind of an easier way to think about it. Um, okay, now, we always need to think about what's happening in terms of the Cauchy stress tensor. This is a very simple test, the uniaxial tension test, extremely simple. It's easy to fall into the trap of thinking only about axial stress and axial strain because that's what we're imposing and that's what we're measuring. But there are in fact other stress components that we can still fully populate the Cauchy stress tensor. So in this case, we have the axial stress and all of the other stress components are zero, right? There's no horizontal pressure initially acting on the bar. There's no shear stress in this direction or that direction. There's no torsion on the bar. So um, because there's no horizontal stress, both of those are zero. Because there's no shear stress, all of those are zero. And you end up with the simplest possible Cauchy stress tensor you could ever have. There's just one component there. Now, um, we often get a little bit cavalier when we think about stress and we forget that we, there is a Cauchy stress tensor that we need to worry about. And I'll get to this later. Okay, the uniaxial tension capacity of a steel bar is not always equal to sigma y if there is other stress conditions imposed on it. So in a uniaxial test, there's no other stress condition. Sigma a is the only term. So only one component, very simple, as simple as it gets. Uh, and then we can also compute the stress invariance. So no matter how simple a test is, you can always draw the Cauchy stress tensor. You can always compute Q and P. So Q, the, our formal definition in three dimensions, is one half of the quantity sigma A minus zero squared. So I'm just doing, well, first of all, I'm finding the principal stresses. They are just sigma A, zero, and zero, since there are no shear stresses on this, um, on the off-diagonal terms. The, the vertical direction is the major principal stress direction, and the two orthogonal horizontal directions are the minor and intermediate principal stress directions. So you get sigma a minus zero squared plus sigma a minus zero squared plus zero minus zero squared. And then you sum all that up, multiply by a half, take the square root, and you get simply that um, the Q value is equal to the sigma a value, right? So Q, the deviatoric stress invariant, is equal to the axial stress for this particular test. And then if you wanted to find the mean stress P, you just add together the three principal stress components and divide by three, and you get that the mean stress is sigma A divided by three. Uh, okay, let's look at the Mohr circle of stress, right? For any Cauchy stress tensor, we can also draw a Mohr circle. Um, so really what I'm doing here is, is trying to get you to always remember that stress is a tensor-based quantity. You can think of it either in terms of the invariance or in terms of the Mohr circle, but you should never fall into the trap of just thinking one-dimensionally about stress. Okay, it's always tensor-based. So if you draw the Mohr circle, we have uh, two points, right? One, and, and we're gonna draw it at yield. So sigma A is equal to sigma Y at the yield point. Um, so here's the major principal stress, sigma one. Here's the minor principal stress, which is the horizontal direction, sigma three is zero. And then you sketch a circle, right? And I, I'm not drawing a perfect circle here, but anyway, you get the point. And the radius of that circle is equal to the yield stress divided by two, sigma y over two, right? So here's sigma y, that's the diameter. The maximum shear stress that's imposed or the maximum value of um, shear stress is sigma y over two. Um, so let's talk about some conclusions from this. First of all, all materials reach a yield point at some high stress level, and in particular, some high deviatoric stress invariant value. There's no such thing as a material that will never yield. You can always break it, no matter how strong it is, uh, as long as you impose a big enough stress invariant on it. Um, okay, and then no matter how simple or how complicated a stress condition may be, we can always compute invariance, Q and P, and we can always draw a Mohr circle. So keep that in mind. 
it turns out that we tend to use very simple laboratory tests to measure strength, but loading conditions that happen in real life might be much more complicated. And so it becomes really important to relate the laboratory strength to the field loading condition. And you have to do it in a way that follows tensor-based stress um, concepts. All right, so that's it for this first.